Well, let me hear you work some work through some thirds then. Okay. Just nice and slow. Um, tune her on. Don't worry about a metronome, but tune her on. <laughs> about um, using thirds as an exercise. And especially, Riley, as, you, as we work to establish very efficient routines for you to practice, is that in addition to just the technical exercise of working around thirds and making sure that your transitions are nice and clean and your fingers are moving quickly but not far so that they're nice, clean transitions, we also obviously can kind of um, treat it as a long tone study so that as we work our way through the thirds, we're also doing the ear training of hearing the interval so that when we play the note, we're confirming that, yes, I heard the interval correctly. And also I was set up physiologically so that the note was in tune. Okay. So do it again and go even go, let yourself go slower as needed and really hear the interval, hear that third before you play it. And let's see if we can um, get to the proper pitch more quickly because we're really hearing it before we play it. Good, go ahead and stop there, Riley. Good. Okay, so what did you observe in that? Well, I didn't wanna take a ton of time between notes, I was mostly just paying attention to make sure that I was in the ballpark of the, the note being in tune. As you heard the interval, and I know that you have a good ear, did you find that even though you heard the interval correctly, sometimes when you played the interval, it wasn't correct, meaning your, so your setup was not getting there correctly? Or do you feel like you hear it and it gets there right away? Further away, the higher I go. Oh, not well, and it's not like it's like terribly off. It, it's just it's just harder to get it in tune right away. The higher I go in, yeah. in the register. So this is something I've been thinking a lot. I've been doing this in with my broken arpeggios, but the thirds works well too because we we can kind of stack exercises on top of each other, and letting letting yourself to go letting yourself go a little bit slower, so that you can do the ear training exercise but making sure that fundamentally that pitch that you're on is in tune before you go to here and then play the next pitch. So here was your big assignment for the week. And I'm really excited to see what you have come up with. So the assignment was, what is the equation to playing a great diminuendo? Thinking about air, lip pressure and embouchure and pitch. What do you think? The, um, the louder you play up high, the more lip pressure you're going to need, but you can't give too much. <laughs> it's, it's obviously a healthy balance with all of it. Um, but as you're coming down and you're diminuendoing, you need to have, you still need to have a firm embouchure, but it, it'll, it slowly needs to let up and yeah. not, it, it can't be all at once or it can't stay tight. It, it needs to slowly let go. Yeah. And so if we were to summarize all of that, what we learn is that our embouchure is constantly changing, right? It's constantly changing. And I think that's one of the challenges, very spe specific to bassoon. And I, but with bassoon, it is a constantly altering embouchure. And this is what can be problematic for a young player when you're teaching them because they kind of want to set the embouchure and go right? And you have to very quickly in developing a young bassoonist, get them to realize, no, this is a constantly changing thing, right? I want to go back to this book that I showed you last week. This is the Arthur Weisberg. So I'm going to do some reading aloud to you. Are you ready? Are you with me? All right. Okay. So he's talking about, and this is on page eight. He's talking about intonation of put and pitch. The two parameters of air and embouchure can be changed in four ways. Any of these changes by itself will produce a change in pitch. The four ways are more air, less air, 
tightening the embouchure and loosening the embouchure. I'm going to first use, so I'll, I'll play a C just in tune. Then I'll add more air. Then I'm going to do less air. Then I'm going to tighten my embouchure and loosen my embouchure. So just loosen it and then you're going to do the same. So in tune, more air, less air, tighten an embouchure, loosen an embouchure. place so now you do it so play your c in tune more air less air tightening and loosening start with it in tune okay. So knowing those four things also, it's really important to recognize that we can use any of those four things in combination or on their own to also help us adjust pitch, which obviously when teaching a young bassoonist, almost every note has to be adjusted in some way, you know? Okay, so those are our four fundamental tools in adjusting pitch. More air, less air, tighten the embouchure or loosen the embouchure. But typically we have to do some of these in conjunction with each other. And that's what you were talking about. That's what we were thinking about this past week is like what has to happen at the same time. And the fact is, as you change um, into the three main registers of three main <coughs> of the bassoon, it changes drastically. Okay, so the player will realize by now that a note is in tune only when a particular quantity of air and a particular embouchure setting are used. And this is what I refer to as kind of having it set up physiologically, right? Each note has a sweet spot where the amount of air and the amount of lip pressure equals a perfectly in tune note. And the fact is that on the bassoon, it's different for every note. So for example, I now want you to play a low C, medium uh, dynamic, a low C just played in tune, okay? <laughs> Okay, now, I want you to take note of what that all felt like. That's your setting, your physiological setting. If you need to play it again, that's fine. But now I want you to use that setting, don't change it, and play your C two octaves higher, but with your low C setting. Sense, yeah. Uh, flat. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So now here be here comes the risk as an educator. The things that we need to do to get that C set for your tenor C are what? What do you need? What What do we have to do to get that C up in pitch in the tenor range? Well, it's it's in the throat partially, but you have to tighten your arm, sure. But you have, to... you have to do a lot of things. Yes. So let's talk through it. So using those four things, are we going to use more air or less air in that tenor C? More air. Are we going to use a tighter embouchure or a looser embouchure? Tighter. It's a tighter embouchure. So just in those four fundamental things. And then this is the trouble we get into because students, while we tell a bassoonist, a young bassoonist, you need to kind of snug up that embouchure. We also don't want them biting. Biting. Yeah. And so explaining to a developing bassoonist that their embouchure has to be flexible and spontaneous but never bite, and yet some notes require a more structured embouchure, right? It's like trying to find the right words. Ultimately, yeah, in a way they are kind of biting, but we don't want them to be, ever be thinking about biting the reed because then they're just gonna clamp off vibration with the reed, okay? All right, so fun. Um, there are, a tr Mr. Weisberg goes on to say, there are a tremendous number of possible settings on each instrument, and one of the main tasks of the player is to become thoroughly familiar with all of them. It's funny, in all of my favorite um, bassoon resource books, he explains this the best out of all of them, and this is why I really, really love this book. Kim Walker and it's called Spirited Wind Playing. This is a newer resource. I honestly have not read this book all the way through. I'm still, I was just turned on to it last year. It was published in 2017. I just found it in 2019. I purchased it and I, I just kind of have, I open up to sections as I think about my own practicing. And so I was uh, preparing for your lesson by going to her section on embouchure. And she actually has some interesting, um, 
um, exercises on finding different parts of your embouchure. Okay, but first I wanna introduce you to your three embouchure zones. Okay, you ready for this? So here's what she does. She, she has um, broken the embouchure into three parts. Here they are. The middle right here, which is where you have most contact with your reed. And then your corners, right? And that's what we can adjust, you know, smile or frown. And, and this is very controversial depending on like what school of training you come to. Even I feel like generationally, I feel like older players um, play with a smile. I have adopted and I teach my students to kind of frown. Okay, so corners. So we have middle where we touch the reed, corners down, and then this area in between that I'm not convinced I have much control over. And that's what I was reading about today before you came into your lesson. So let's also kind of just experience these areas of the embouchure. And I want you to play to see, and I want you to go back and forth between smiling and frowning. <laughs> probably seems obvious, but this is really good to just articulate what we're experiencing. Okay, so what do you hear with the smile? What do you hear with the frown? Actually, I, I feel like I have to find like a happy medium for it to be in tune. Right. I, because if I frown too much, it's grossly flat. If I smile, this rate is actually not, it's not very centered right now. Um, yeah. but it's, it's just a little bit sharp. Yes. Okay. So now play your lowest C mm -hmm. and play it where you normally would play it. Good. Great. Stop there. Now play your high, high C where you would normally play it. So set yourself up for a normal high C. Now describe for me the difference between your corners, between your high C setting and your low C setting. So I still try and frown, like it, most of it is just from being taught, um, but it's tied my, my corners are tighter. They're, they don't smile, but they're tighter on the high C. So I'm curious, go ahead and do a smile on the high C and see if that changes your experience. If you just commit to a smile. <laughs> It's, it's like really, really, really sharp. It's really sharp. Does it come out more easily or does it make no difference with um, articulation? I actually feel like it's, it's uh, um, missing something. It's missing like the core. Yes, the note. yes, and, and absolutely. And so that's an important thing too, is that um, as we drive our pitch up on notes, of course, and we were just talking about this in music technology, if we understand frequency and acoustic nature, you know, a note has to ring at the right frequency to have the projection given in the natural acoustic order of things. Um, and so if we're sitting sharp on a note, of course, it's going to like, it damages the projection and the quality of the sound. And then you also know that I also move up onto my reed. I move up onto that wire to create more resistance too. But especially as I go above that high C. I feel like once I get above that high C, I really start to bring in those corners. And I don't know that I smile because when I smile, my, my lips actually get wider. Right. And really I go, I, I bring my corners in. Okay. Yes. Yes. And so that's the difference too, is um, as we think about, again, what else can our embouchure do? It's the idea of bringing them in versus bringing them out. And that creates a different sound as well. If we, if we push them out, it also forces us to take in more read. And so that gets a more covered sound. Do that yourself for a second. Um, think like a pucker and then like a line. Pucker, line, pucker, line, just on that middle C. We have talked about 
talked about a lot of different things. What is the point of any of this? Well, a huge part of this is as we are developing younger players, more than just having them practice and like do things, play etudes and play scales, what we really need a young player to do, and not just a young player, I need you guys to do this too. We need to explore. We need to play around in our practice. We need to find, you know, where is the setting for that C and then the C above it and then the C above it and then the C below it, right? What is a setting? Is it a smile? Is it a frown? Is it loose? Is it tight, right? It's different for each one. And it just, it takes time. Like when we think about um, developing concepts of like beautiful tone and projection, it takes time to find where every note on the bassoon sits and where it's going to vibrate at and how do we physically get the bassoon to that point as fast as possible and then also recognizing that there's over three octaves on the bassoon that's a lot of notes basically to memorize you know um so there's nothing fast about becoming a masterful bassoon player and that's masterful like at a sixth grade level and a 10th grade level and you know what i mean like there's mastery at all these different points but so much of this process is really giving yourself the time to just like listen and explore and play around. It, it's so important, um, which is why Riley, I always spend so much time on fundamentals. Yes, I could assign millions of etudes, but all that is just notes that you're playing. And really what I need you to do is just like, not you, but like the student to dig into the instrument and find the beauty of tone. So one more thing I want to say, and this takes us back to doing our thirds. In addition to it being a technique exercise and an ear training exercise, it's also a beautiful note exercise, right? And if we can add, if we are, if we have to be very efficient with our practice time, we can also create beauty in these and between these notes. Right, crescendoing into each note and getting to that beautiful spot in the core of the note so that it projects and it vibrates, right? And so suddenly it's not just thirds, it's technique and it's ear training and it's musicality or tone production or tone exercises or whatever you want to call it, right? And so as now we take, we take one exercise, we can spend 15 minutes on it and it's really, really valuable. And that's really, really efficient. So I want you to do the thirds one more time. And I want you to think about finding that beautiful setting for each note. And if you just, you can even just do one octave, okay? But really indulge the beauty of each note. <laughs> Yeah, it's funny. I even heard you just, I mean, it's intuitive. You started to put a little bit of vibrato in there, you know, but I even, even over Zoom, I could hear the beauty of the tone and the connection between the notes, right? And so now we've done something really special with just thirds. No, it's no longer just thirds. Now it's like, it's like everything in one exercise. It's beautiful. <laughs>